Hello and welcome to the Kuimunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for Exploration Series. I'm Paul Rivera, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, um, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, Advisors, Volunteers and Supporting Members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. The Kuimunga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is related in, and reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. So it's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars and in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. These weekly discussions are available. A lot of them are on demand. We have a couple of hundred presentations between webcasts and YouTubes and podcasts. All these presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, of course, we want to invite you to become a supporting member. And we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queer Manga Institute. Today, let's explore the relationship of the human story in the context of deep time. If you're not familiar with that term, deep time, it's referring to the geological or cosmological time scale that spans an extremely vast amount, often in the order of millions and sometimes billions of years. So when we look to the human story within that broader perspective of deep time, we gain a, a humbling perspective that underscores our own dependency and interconnectedness of all things in the grand scale of the universe. Carl Sagan, the well-known astronomer, puts it this way, quote, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Well, this institute is all about, as its underlining mission, joining this long-standing cause to right our relations with ourself, with our community, with the universe at large. And this is something our earliest ancestors paid great attention to down through the ages. And we consider our own practice one means to do just that. We have additional tools that they not, uh, they didn't. We greatly expand our self, our bandwidth, our comfort level, our sense of belonging, our gratitude for this magnificent universe when we understand it in this largest context of deep time. The 14 billion years the universe had to come to this moment, to create us among everything else, to create a creature to behold this magnificence, mm -hmm. to delight in what is emerging. And this is why we're delighted to sit down with our guest today, Jennifer Morgan. She's helping make this grand vision of our world and our place in it come alive. She's an award-winning author, storyteller, educator, and inspired early on by the work of Teilhard de Chardin, Maria Montessori, Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, one of our guests. Her Universe Story Trilogy is used in childhood classrooms around the world as a cosmic education curriculum. And you know, kids start off asking these big existential questions. I know I did. <laughs> and it's just part of our curiosity as we get oriented to this world, right? Why is the sky blue? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for adults to explore these concepts as well, because, I mean, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Jennifer founded and heads the Deep Time Network. And I love this term, deep time. I know it's a geological term, but for me, it references not just time in a linear straight line as we tend to think of it, but it hints at a deep well, a cauldron comes to mind of things stirring and bubbling and evolving with some larger hand stirring the pot, the pool, this womb of creation. So these are exciting and juicy concepts. And really science is coming to the fore to underscore them, to expand our, our, our own understanding of who we are and where we are as part of the universe, as Sagan put it, as all these great minds put it, and as Jennifer is um, 
forging ahead, making this so accessible. So we want to welcome Jennifer. Hello. Good to have you here. And I, oh. I my, 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 our introductions are inadequate because we have asked Brian Tucker, our great friend, your mm. great friend, to help us, who put us all together, to help introduce us, introduce you and why this discussion is so exciting, why the work that you're doing is so valuable. Hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Hey, hello, everyone. Yep, I'm, I'm excited to have Jennifer here and uh, to have our community learn more about her work not you know not only um, the work of being an author of this amazing trilogy uh, series and her work with the Tay Art Association, the American Tay Art Association, but as the president of the Deep Time Nem Deep Time Network and her work promoting community leadership uh, and Deep Time concepts. So Jennifer and I we met twenty years ago, kind of probably more than that when I worked for the Catholic Church running a program on interfaith spirituality. And at that time, she had just published her first book, Born with a Bang, which is um, this remarkable book, children's book that tells the story of the birth of the universe based on the science of cosmology. And I had the opportunity to invite Jennifer to do a reading of her book to our small interfaith community at what was called the Vincentian Renewal Center in Plainsboro, New Jersey. And as she told the story and she entered into that persona. She put on her starry covered robe that afternoon. <laughs> and I witnessed something like astonishing and masterful in Jennifer's transformation into a storyteller. It was as if the voice of the universe was speaking directly through her. Um, mm -hmm. She so well embodied this. And that's the connection I see with the Cuyamonga community. We teach um, ritual body postures and often these postures can awaken in us this profound connection to this greater web of life. And sometimes we can also feel like the voice of the universe is moving through us as well. So I'm, I'm hoping today that our audience can like learn about Jennifer's vision and commitment to te teaching deep time principles. And I'm curious to learn how ritual body postures might help us further embody this creativity of the universe um, which is always guiding us towards greater awareness and deeper empathy with life. So I'm, I'm really excited, Jennifer, that you could be with us. I'm thankful for all the work you're doing, Jennifer, because as Brian said, we have these experiences and they're not just, you put substance to it when science comes and says, oh, indeed, what you've just felt, what you've just put in mythopoetic terms, there's some science to this. So uh, that's exciting. Your book that Brian referenced, you, your book is told from the perspective of the universe speaking and telling a child what the grand picture is and who they really are in that, in that vision. Oh. How did you come to write that? Thank you, Brian. Wonderful introduction. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Brian. And that was just so fascinating the way you made that connection between the storytelling and the body postures because storytelling is a body posture <laughs> because you really experience it. So mm -hmm. it comes into your body. And we call it the language of spirit because we think that's how it works through us. Yeah, wow. absolutely. Yeah. Th so, anyway, th thank you for making that connection, Brian. That was, that was really profound. Um, well, I want to say that uh, I want to go back a little bit to my grandmother for a second, because um, she and her husband, my grandfather, uh, would spend their summers down in the Southwest, your part of the world. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and that's where they got to know Native Americans, Native American culture, the mythology, the stories, and they had this really deep immersion um, in the culture. And then when they went to New York, um, moved to New York from California, my grandmother, her name is Barbara Morgan, she saw the dancer Martha Graham, and she immediately saw that the mythological themes that she had seen down in the Southwest were being played out inside of Martha's dances. Oh, and God. so she decided to do a book on Martha's dances, the photographs. And uh, so her book came out, um, Smithsonian Magazine called her the premier dance photographer of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And one of her images, um, Letter to the World, um, was 
uh, turned into a US postage stamp. So, and she was very, very, um, you know, important part of my childhood, you know, spending time with her and being immersed in this world of mythology. She became a very close friend with Joseph Campbell. So I would visit her, Joseph Campbell would be there. She would take me to his lectures. So I grew up on that. You know, this is the <laughs> world I lived in. I swam in this. You know? <laughs> and, and it was my grandmother who told me the story how, you know, things might look still, like a table might look like it's not moving. Mm. But if you sink down into the table, you could make yourself so, so small. <laughs> you would see that everything is vibrant. Yeah. Because everything those electrons are dancing. Alive. Yeah. Everything's dancing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There you exactly. go. Back to the dance. Yeah. Yeah. And so then my mother uh, was an organist and a liturgist, so um, in churches. And so she would create these amazing liturgies with dance and music and drumming. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd get the entire congregation, you know, out into the aisles dancing. <laughs> Which so, I'm sure is how spirituality was celebrated, you know, long ago. Exactly. Yeah. Just the very old tradition. Our roots, our human roots, <laughs> the cosmic roots, too. And get it flowing through the body and the mind and the heart, right? It's about the flow. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I I grew up in that with her. And then um, just the act of creating the rituals, you know, what, what's involved in that? How do you do it? Um, and then, of course, experiencing it. So this was all, you know, imprinted on me. <laughs> And so you had these elements that meant so much to you in your childhood. You've developed a way to try to offer them to others, ch children and adults alike, it seems to me. Exactly. Exactly. And then when I was, um, I lived with Catholic sisters when I was in my uh, early 20s, while I was getting my degree in theology at the University of San Francisco, a Jesuit university. And so then I had that experience of living in community with um, these Catholic sisters. And that was also very important experience as well. Um, the bonding of the community, you know, through these shared ways of thinking about things. And then later I met um, a Dominican sister, uh, Sister Miriam McGillis, who ran Genesis Farm in Blairstown, New Jersey. And she had started a program based on uh, Thomas Berry's work and Brian Swim's work, an earth literacy program that was drawing people from all over the world, you know, to this little place in New Jersey. And so these people were coming, being immersed in the science of the story, being immersed in rituals around how to tell the story and experience it in an embodied way mm -hmm. through meditation walks out on the land. Um, and then these people would go off to all these different countries in the world and start centers. Um, so it was a really exciting time. This is uh, 1997. That's when I did that program. You know, Brian has and, mentioned um, this gal and this nun and introduced us to several others. And it's exciting how so many nuns within the Catholic Church are ex exploring new ways of just revving up the spiritual feeling moving through them and uh, creating new ways. I mean, women's wisdom coming to the fore again. <laughs> you bet. You bet. <laughs> There's some they're dynamic like, nuns out there. They're, they're just like the mycelium that are just, you know, going all over the place around the world. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so then um, it really, your introduction was so beautiful uh, because the power of that, you know, you were talking, Paul, about this last program you did, Your Mind on Art. Yes. Well, what we're talking about today is your mind on deep time. Yes. <laughs> your mind on deep time. It's an altered state. That's the thing. And I have seen it in all ages. So um, 
and this is where, you know, I was so inspired by what happened at Genesis Farm. And uh, we, we, had, we were given this assignment to tell the story in our own way. And somehow or other, I got the idea to tell it in the first person, you know, like I was the universe. And that I really push myself beyond my comfort zone. I am just gonna be running around the room. I'm gonna be screaming. I'm gonna be rolling on the floor. <laughs> and I had this, I had this whole birthing scene <laughs> and I just said, I am just going to go all out. And I'm, I was scared to death, honestly. And then after I did it, there was just dead silence in the room. And, and then the first person to say anything was, uh, Suzanne Golis. I remember it clearly. She said, that was beautiful. That was a beautiful thing I've seen. And I certainly was not thinking beauty. Beauty was not the operative word at all on my mind when I created it. So I got the idea to, um, cause my son was six years old at the time. So I would go home and tell him everything I was learning. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I didn't really expect him to be interested. You know, I was just looking for an audience. <laughs> <laughs> He, he turned out to actually be interested in what his mother was saying. Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> you know? um, and so I'd tell him these bedtime stories at night, light a candle and about how stars. Oh, make it a ritual. Mm -hmm. Stars mm -hmm. are born and stars live and they die like you and me. And so I could see in the dark, you know, his, his eyes getting big. And, <laughs> because and, it rings true. It strikes some deep chord in us. We know yeah. this. We just yeah. need to be reminded. Exactly. Yeah. And so once I, oh my gosh, he's interested in this. So then I got the idea to write a book for kids. And he happened to be at the Montessori school here in Princeton. Um, and that's how I got to know about Montessori cosmic education, which I had no idea about, you know, before I started this work. Um, and it, at the same time that I was getting my universe immersion, my son was getting his universe immersion in his classroom. And the teacher told me, wow, this book you're right, because I shared it with her. You know, this book you're writing fits right in to the Montessori cosmic education curriculum. Could you give a shout out to Maria Montessori and why she she was inspired to make a cosmic curriculum there for kids? Absolutely. It's such an incredible story. Um, she was invited to India. Um, this is toward the end of her life, by the way. You know, she spent the most she of her life there too. early childhood. Yeah. <laughs> And she was invited by the Theosophical Society mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, while she was there, World War II broke out. And she and her son were put under house arrest because, of course, England was, you know, colonized by England. I mean, India was colonized by England and they were from Italy. They're Italian citizens. So they spent the duration of the war under house arrest. And that's when they developed cosmic education because they she she was trained as a medical doctor so observe as a scientist observation was how she came to things and she saw that it's at age six when the child asked the question where did everything come from yeah so she concluded that's when you give them the cosmic story. Don't wait until high school. Uh, I certainly don't wait until college. Give them the story when they're asking the question. So you know, respect yeah. them yeah. to be intelligent, to understand. Exactly. Yeah. It's that exposure like yourself and your grandmother being exposed yeah. to these this this vast um, category of thinking that your worldview was uh, already expanded at such a young age that it just gave you confidence to continue to pursue. Well, that. look at what the native uh, cultures are doing, the indigenous cultures around the world. That's part of their from the very curriculum beginning. from yeah. the beginning. From the very yeah. beginning, you're right. In their stories and yeah. their mythologies and their wisdom and their mm. practices, yeah. 
exactly but exactly paul yeah it's so important to get that sensitization early on mm -hmm. and at the point because maria montessori talked about your sensitive periods we every human has sensitive periods when they can absorb things more easily like you can absorb language you know more easily at certain times through osmosis, and, just being around yeah. it. I mean, yeah. there's a ton of research talking about how being exposed to music and the learning of music at an early age, at a very early Actually, age, impacts your life. That's how your brain develops. Everything shifts completely, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And exactly. also it's reassuring, it's comforting to know that you're part of a grand whole, huh. right? It's yeah. beautiful, it's majestic, it's soul Absolutely. Yeah. And that is one of the huge, I mean, I have a whole huge talk on this about, um, you know, how most education is so fractured that um, you're not given your connection to the whole. And and the pathology comes right out of that. Yep. You know, the pathologies is mm. directly- The dissociation, related. the disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it kind of creates a, a, an opportunity for a child to become a global citizen very early on and to have that perspective of being a global a citizen. cosmic citizen yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah right even beyond globally right yeah yeah both <laughs> <laughs> global and cosmic yeah, global is a good start and then when you realize that everything you do becomes just if people go oh well then you're a tiny spot in this vast no everything you do becomes significant you're exactly. harmonizing with a greater much greater good you're part of that whole yeah Right. Exactly. Yeah. Everything that right happened there. before created this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And we are creating the future. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. So then I, I, since I live in Princeton, I decided, you know what? I really want to get the most up to date science. So I just walked right over to the institution in Princeton, which is, you know, That's just right down the road here. Yeah. And I took uh, five courses <clears throat> in astronomy, cosmology, um, mammal evolution, and uh, anthropology, and I think I'm missing one here. <laughs> but anyway, That's a uh, yeah. yeah, no, here we go. Yeah, cosmology, astronomy, mammal evolution, anthropology. Um, there's one other one that I'm forgetting. I but like anyway. mammal evolution to be included in that because how does the universe work through these life forms and and evolve them and create them? What are the influences? Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly. a big picture that's not often included in the big cosmic story. So yeah. Exactly. Yep. Why do we exist and that's why we're when yeah. you're putting it all together as a single story. Because yeah. it's a single life. story. And it's not yeah. separate. You don't have life and then the inanimate universe. It's one big cauldron. It's one big <laughs> scene. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The distinction between life and non-life becomes very, very different. Blurry. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Mm. So then, of course, I, I found uh, Dana... Uh, Lynn Anderson, who is the illustrator of my books. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole amazing, every, every, at every point, there was some amazing story that brought me together with somebody <laughs> like, like when, uh, you know, I decided to work on the books and I didn't have an income. And then this guy came and gave me a $20,000 check <laughs> to keep working. He was from the infinity foundation and somebody connected the two of us that was just unbelievable and then um mm. i mean so many stories like that and coming together you with into your artist and she happened to be influenced by the same teachers that you were you said exactly yes yes and that was completely fortuitous how the two of us came together yep universe works in mysterious ways it <laughs> does it does it really really does yeah so, you know, then the books came out and then I immediately started getting invitations all over to Montessori schools and yeah. Montessori conferences uh, because of the connection to that curriculum. And uh, then um, of course I was very immersed in the world of Thomas Berry and Brian Swim. And then we added on the whole Montessori world, which is huge. You know, you go to those national conferences, there'll be 3000 people there. Oh, wow. So, 
yeah so you know when they have the keynote addresses you're like in this huge room with just a sea of people um and it's very inspiring and i did give a keynote to one of those conferences back in uh, 2013. Um, and then the big history world is a whole nother world that's looking at the whole cosmic story that started by uh, David Christian, Fred Spear, numerous others at the college level. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Gaia Systems people, um, you know, people like um, Ilya Prigogine and Lynn Margulis and all those people who are lo looking at you know, the earth, the whole earth as a single organism. And self-regulating and- Exactly. Show me some yeah. mm. Exactly. So then all along the while, I'm noticing, oh my gosh, there are all these different worlds that don't know about each other. Yeah. Like- oh, Thomas Or Perry that connective tissue, right? Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Like the Thomas Berry people don't know about Maria Montessori. Mm. The Montessori people don't know about- <laughs> Thomas Berry, and then there's big history and all this. Um, and so I kept thinking, oh my gosh, everybody's like trying to reinvent the wheel, but you know, a lot of this stuff is already figured out. Yeah. yeah. And so if we can uh, interact, then the whole thing can uh, evolve, you know. And thus and, was born the Deep Time Network. Exactly. It'll be that node point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because the adult, first starting out with children, but then all of a sudden seeing the adults need to totally put it in perspective and connect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 A lot of people and, have a piece of the pie, put it all together. And, yeah. Yeah. and Brian was there from the beginning. Uh, Yay, Brian. <laughs> More than 10 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Founding board member. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so what are some of the go ahead no no i didn't mean to write. what are some of the basic principles that tie deep time together and all these various what are some of the shared guiding principles that and because you know you're articulating this for a world that has grown up on the disconnects and the siloed institutions and bodies of knowledge so yeah. what are those yeah there's what are those cross connections here that bring it all into a whole okay so um i'll share the slides and we'll talk okay. about the deep time principles okay so let's just because it's exciting when you start cooking it down to its essence right and, and, it, and it, like yeah. how it transcends the intellect and that's embodied knowledge and that's what brian is talking about in the beginning of the conversation and that we whereas those what are the worlds come together where we can do both the experiential and that of of educational and, and bring it in all to one yeah one foundation exactly exactly paul so anyway i just just so you have a context for where you know this thinking is coming out of um, this is the Deep Time Network. This is the homepage. And just to say that uh, we have over 2,000 members from over 40 countries. Beautiful. And we offer prof professional development for teachers. So the programs that I was giving in person, uh, we now have available online. And not just me giving teaching them, but many other amazing people teaching them. And uh, your timeline also... is where a deep time perspective empowers evolution. So this is like a co-creation, right? The more that we expand our bandwidth, you could say, the more that we, I don't know, we're we're agency um, to help evolution along. So we exactly. have exactly, oh. definitely, it's a participatory evolution. And that you're going to. That's exactly understand. what the principles are about. You, you're, you're really on it, Laura. <laughs> you you, you know time. this already. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, both of you. Um, so the deep time principles we drew them from the work of Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, also Ignatian pedagogy. Ignatius was the founder of the Jesuits. So we also incorporated themes from that as well. 
And then we also pulled in the Montessori cosmic education. Mm -hmm. And um, now originally uh, when we drafted them and one of our board members, Orla Hazra, um, was very, very instrumental in developing the deep time principles. And she's the one who, she has a um, PhD in religious education. And um, she, she was very immersed in the Ignatian uh, pedagogy. Um, and so originally we were applying them to deep time learning. But what you can see, you'll soon see, is that you can take these principles and apply them to absolutely any field whatsoever. <laughs> um, we also have a deep time leadership program on the network. So we're applying them to leadership. And then, as I said, you can apply them to any field. So here are the principles. I'll just give the names and then we'll go into each one um, in more depth. Context, matrix, subjectivity, action, and continuum. Mm -hmm. So let's look at context first. Okay. So just to define context as a sphere of action and meaning in space and time. Okay. So one might say, well, I've got a lot of contexts. And for sure you do. You know, there's the context of the individual, like your body. Your body is a context. Mm -hmm. You know, it has all this stuff going on and it's a whole, you know, it's an entity. Um, your family is a context. It's a sphere of meaning and action, your family, your town. Your town is a sphere of meaning and action, your country, the earth, the universe. But what, and this whole, many of you I'm sure have heard, know the idea of holons, that we are holes within holes. Nested. Yeah, yeah exactly. Nested like that. <laughs> Seen it in there yes nested dolls nested contexts or holons within holons mm. but what is the biggest context mm. so the largest context is the universe yeah from a tiny atom to molecules to a universe right just yeah Exactly. So inside of this um, principle of context, we're choosing this context of the universe to orient to it. So you know how you can take a magnet over iron filings and yeah. then they all line up? <laughs> so that's what we're doing in a deep time orientation. We're orienting to the whole. I see. Like, what is the whole trying to do? Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at it like a story from the beginning. It's signaling us in every moment, right? It, it, exactly. It's signaling us in every moment. And it's and you can see that it's trying to do stuff. It keeps trying to do stuff. And we're part of that. Orientation. So what is that exceeding. process? It's not just trying, it's succeeding. It's running the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> running the show, right? Right, right. So then we can see that there's this developmental, time developmental nature to the universe. You know, the Big Bang is down here. And then it comes up. And then we go around. And this, of course, is life on Earth coming all the way around. And the human, of course, shows up way toward the end. <laughs> of this incredible story you know 13.8 billion year story so context has this spatial and time dimensional uh nature to it now what's the second the second principle is matrix so whereas in context we're looking to the whole that we're part of in matrix, we're, we're understanding our embeddedness. 
we're understanding the re relationality of everything. Mm -hmm. So nothing can be by itself without everything else. Um, so this brings up the idea of a superorganism. Mm -hmm. The matrix is related to this idea of a superorganism, that Earth is a superorganism, that the whole universe is a superorganism. Mm -hmm. As Thomas Berry says, everything is integral and interacts with everything else. This means that nothing is itself without everything else. Mm. There's a commonality and an integrity and intimacy of the universe with itself. Mm. Yeah, let that one sink in. Yeah. So then subjectivity, that's understanding that everything has a subjectivity, an autopoiesis. It has a power. It has a power to create something new. Oh. And it, this is it's all part of a cosmogenetic field of interiority and creativity. So cosmogenesis, and uh, I don't know when Brian Swim came, but you probably have talked about this uh, word in your program, that you, we move from a static cosmos to a cosmogenesis, meaning everything is creating something new. You know, now, what does, what does that mean for the human? So subjectivity in humans this is where allurement what is what are we yearning for hmm. and in this inside of this these deep time pre it's a cosmic yearning it's not just about the individual it's a cosmic yearning yeah, yeah. it's a cosmic leading a cosmic longing this cosmic drive for experience, perception. There's actually somebody home here. <laughs> there's there's actually a Laura, you know, there's a Laura and a Paul experiencing things, longing for things. Mm. And that that's a driver of evolution. What, what we are longing for is driving evolution. What I appreciate also about this, Jennifer, is that in embodied spirituality, embodied month, we are designed with so many receptor sites to perceive this, to have this ripple through us and, and do just that, experience and perceive, experience the numinous. We're designed for that. And our culture has put that by the wayside. Mm -hmm. It's time to reclaim that capacity mm -hmm. and that gift. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that you're doing it in the way that you're you're doing this, it's our mission as well. Experience the numinous, and exactly, behold. and celebrate. And, and it's not for just the few; it's for everybody. For everybody, yeah. It's for everyone. It's issued at birth when we put on the earth suit, and say hello to this world. Yeah, yeah. So then, action principle number three. What is action? And you said it, you said it, uh, Laura. Action is to participate in evolution of the whole. Mm -hmm. We don't always know that we're doing that. You know, it's like um, plants. Uh, Maria Montessori talks about cosmic gift and task. And this is where it, action is the gift and the task. That's our action. Um, and we're not just talking about humans. So right. let's say plants, you know, plants have a gift and a task, cosmic gift and task. The gift is that they can split water molecules. Uh, the hydrogen goes up into the air and then it becomes available mm -hmm. for us know, to breathe. Yeah. For us to breathe. Exactly. So they're doing it for their own thriving. But at the same time, it's it's a contribution to the whole. So those two things come together. So like if somebody loves to, to play music, you know, maybe a drummer 
or somebody loves to lead rituals or do the work that you're doing. You're doing it because you love to do it. You're doing it for yourself, but right. you're, but it's, it's also having an impact on the whole beyond you. Exactly. Mm. On the whole. Exactly. Well said. So Maria Montessori said, humans are cosmic agents. Oh, wow. Our purpose is to evolve the universe. Isn't that incredible? Beautiful. Back in the 1940s. This, like over half a century ago. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, her book, um, To Educate the Human Potential, in which she laid out the cosmic education curriculum, that came out in 19, 1947. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the world has not caught up to Maria Montessori by any stretch. <laughs> oh, my word. Um, then the fifth uh, principle, um, continuum. So this is to continue deep time learning across all stages of life. So this is the idea that, um, you know, we have different stages of life and each stage has a different aspect to it, a different way in which we're getting to know the universe and contributing to the universe. So I put my baby picture in here. Oh. <laughs> Low, lower right there's me with my son here oh, sweet. and here's me with my 92 year old mother <laughs> um this is and the liturgist the right here on the left yeah. <laughs> um that every stage has its unique characteristics so you know when we're zero to six that would be when you're like here getting to know the world through taste touch and then later in the elementary year is getting to know it through story. That's mm -hmm. where time comes in and we get to know it through story. And then as we move into the adolescent years is when we realize, oh my gosh, we're in the story. <laughs> we're in it. <laughs> and that's really scary to realize, oh my God, I'm actually in the story. This is not just a story I'm reading. I'm mm. in it. <laughs> I think that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And, and I have to say our visionary experiences, we are the hero in the little hero journey that's unfolding. We're, we're right there. It's happening through us. The yeah. vision. Uh, it's the same thing. Universe yeah. loves story. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and also we're in the story. And even more than that, we are the story. Yeah. And who's the poet like, that said the universe is not made up of atoms, but of stories, mm -hmm. right? Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, somebody will put it in the chat. Room yes, sure. thank you. We'll yeah. be able to find that. <laughs> um, so again, continuum. Now, I, I was just, because we wrote the, the deep time principles for learning, and we have a whole paper on this, by the way, for educators. Oh, um, which we put a lot of effort into and it's it's actually really good <laughs> um but you could also take continuum way beyond you know the idea of an individual person's development right um, or an individual planet's development right exactly doesn't it also hark back to the Big Bang? You have a tiny point and then look, it blows out and look at it as it evolves. So you go from nothingness to the all and the same kind of complexity developing here just on planet Earth, just on one little tiny speck. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And yes. you know, I was having this discussion, I think, with um our, our dear friend, Monica Duras Bowles, who worked with who works with Brian Swim, and we were contemplating how it is. Um, people question: Are we the only life in the whole cosmos? How could that be? Well, we're the only life that we see. But if you are seeing a universe like this from this perspective, it has to be replete with life. There's no question. That's just what it does, right? So that kind of puts an answer logically to that question. Yeah, definitely. So. Absolutely. And then 
you could also apply the idea of continuum to humankind, you know, the evolution of humanity, that humanity has gone through its developmental phases. And we're somewhere, you know, we're discovering our story. <laughs> I don't think we quite got it yet that we are the story. That's, uh, you know, that's, that we're kind of on that. That's where we're somewhere headed into adolescenthood, I think, you know, as a few more uh, growing pains. Yeah, it, exactly. Children behave. I keep waiting for the cosmic mother to send us to our room now. <laughs> <laughs> Before you hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these governing themes, now this is coming uh, straight from Thomas Berry. Um, and the idea is what is the universe doing? And so the universe is increasing dif differentiation, increasing subjectivity, and increasing communion communion. So let's look at differentiation. There are more different kinds of things now than there were at the beginning. Increasing complexity. Yeah. Increasing, exactly. Increasing complexity. Yep. Universe is a great artist and it just keeps creating, right? Just keeps yeah. creating out new ideas. Yeah. Exactly. We are the lab, are we not? Yeah. 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 Wild and dazzling new forms. That's what I keep talking about in one of my books. Mm -hmm. Um and then increasing subjectivity. So this is, you know, increasing sense of what we were talking about under subjectivity, <clears throat> increasing longing, increasing experience of the numinous, you know, increasing sense of allurement, you know, what's drawing us, you know, these things are increasing in depth mm -hmm. as evolution moves forward which really makes you ask the question, what's it going to be like in a million years? What's it going to be like in a billion years? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can go backwards a billion years and think about what subjectivity looked like at that point. And then here we are now. So what is it going to be in a billion years? It's going to be way different because everything is changing, transforming. And then communion has to do with the interconnection of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we're entangled. So the entanglement is increasing. And of course, Teilhard talked about that a lot. Um, the noosphere, which is, you know, sort of encircling the earth, a mind sphere that is becoming more and more entangled and interconnected. And he talked about this, this was before the internet, you know, so that was pretty amazing that he was able to see that coming. But how was he able to see that? He was able to see it because he was looking at the trajectory. Mm -hmm. He was looking at the tra trajectory. So that's what we can be doing too, is looking at the trajectory and then aligning ourselves with those forces. If I may, before you move on to your next slide, yeah. because you're saying, how do we experience, how do you know this? How do you, and I would say that in our visionary work with ritual body postures, differentiation, we step into the bodies of various animal spirits. We become the sky, we become water molecules running through the hydro cycle. We become the air, we become the void, we become the all. I mean, you you just your boundaries dissolve and you experience that from a first person perspective, looking out the eyes of another. You see life grow. You see the tree of life branching out into the heavens, roots deep into the earth. You have that experience. Subjectivity. We often see a giant eye looking at us with intelligence, with perception, or we become eyes all over the universe to see simultaneously you can be a tiny point and the all simultaneously you feel like you're again boundaries dissolving and you you feel like you're seeing like the universe is growing a gazillion eyes to see through and you're catching a glimpse of it all in one moment and communion 
that's how I define ecstatic. This is ecstatic trance. Communion is you are one with the all. You are one with something larger than yourself. You understand the, you are, you are part of the body of the cosmos. You have these feelings and this direct knowing. And then when you express it, you, you can only say, this is what I felt. And it kind of, it, it doesn't land very well in this culture that we live in. It, it just sounds crazy. But here you're putting the science to it. You're putting these deep and well-respected thinkers to it, saying the same thing, maybe from a different angle, but saying the same thing. And so I am just feeling, oh, you know, there's substance to these experiences. This is all fitting in with this grand picture. This just rings, it just puts, it puts concrete under our feet, a, a good foundation here for these experiences that we've been having all this time and hearing. I've heard thousands and thousands of experiences in the various sessions that we've hosted on this over and over and over again. The universe wants us to experience this and it will find many ways of doing it through the intellect or through this direct experience. We know that when you look at indigenous wisdom, this is what they felt as well. We've got lots of indications of that. So this is just what the universe wants from us. This is this is our cosmic curriculum direct from the universe herself, I would say. So I am very grateful to all that you're doing, Jennifer, you and the whole team, from Maria to Brian to Thomas to Payard the whole team to Brian. Yeah. So thank you. But I just have to, I just have to say, you're asking how Thomas Berry came across it. This is what we're coming across to. Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Wow. Yeah. It's, yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's something about when you bring the, the you know, Thomas Berry talked about the fourfold wisdom traditions. Yeah. There's the, the indigenous tradition, the classical religion tradition, uh, science and women, and Thank when you, you. Bring them <laughs> in all our category, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're a category. Yep, <laughs> that needs to be reintegrated. <laughs> yeah, and and um, I just say the stages of the ages. Also, they had to transcend this limited mindset um, here. You know, yeah. you function here in the everyday world. You're occupied with your everyday tasks. We have to take a moment and shift gears. And that's what that's what this is all about. So Absolutely. many ways to shift gears. So yeah. Yeah. Your your mind on deep time, or you, you want to call that's it mind thing. on cosmogenesis, or your mind on yeah. you know, um we all need this. Um this humans need this. This is this is a human drive to experience the numinous. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um the rituals, you know, the things that humans have developed around the world yeah. uh, to experience that sense of connection, participation in, you know, the larger whole. Or just staring out at nature and letting it speak to you directly as well, right? Yeah. That's what we grew up yeah. with, that's what we're geared to. Um, okay, this is just, uh, I'm not going to talk about all this because it's a lot, but um, maybe this, uh, just this one here, this old story to new story. So for context, we move from the fixed cosmos to a cosmogenesis, an evolving universe. So it's not fixed. In matrix, we move from separation to interrelationship of everything. And then subjectivity, we move from the subjectivity of humans only to humans and to the subjectivity in the whole, the whole. And then for action, move from individual action to participating in evolution of the whole. I don't have um, continuum on here, but here would be the continuum. You would move to an understanding of the developmental, understanding developmental continuum of the individual, of humankind, and of the universe as a whole. I appreciate your icons as well. And I will say that geometric forms show up a lot in our visionary work. And mm. we're familiar with all of those images. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. You know, and I okay. think the universe speaks to us through theater, right? Through yeah. 
and energy and iconography and symbol and color and direct knowing and gesture and words. I mean, it's just all there, the storytelling. So Yeah. From within. Yeah, from within. Yeah. Wow. So and then, you know, we have our a leadership program going, which is a nine month leadership program. What do you uh, cover in leadership? What does leadership mean? And I get the well being, but what does leadership mean in this larger context? Um, well, it would be evolving the universe. Yeah, and I wish all the leaders that's, of the world. That's the simple way of saying it. Required <laughs> to take this curriculum, wouldn't we have a saner world? But yeah, yeah. So we have. Um, I mean, it's all centered on the principles, and we have three modules. Uh, the first module is an introduction uh, to um, uh, to the new cosmology. So this is where the science comes in, and this is where seeing the science, but also seeing a meaningful interpretation of it, you know, seeing the meaning of it. So, um, you know, hum the Human Energy Project, and Monica is all, all over this, um, the three stories, yeah. you know, the first story is the story of um, mythology and religion. The second story is the story of science, but in a very, uh, a science without meaning, mm. you know. And then the third story is looking at science, but then also seeing the meaning in it, seeing the meaning in it, seeing the wisdom, seeing science as, in a way as scripture. So, mm -hmm. for example, when we study quantum theory and see the interconnection of everything, literally, literally, mm -hmm. we can- Or even back to Newton, um, physics yeah. as God's handiwork. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You you can cast it in that light as scripture or not. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so then in the okay, so the first module is that introduction to the new cosmology, and we go through the um the deep time principles. And then the second one is um applying it. So this is where we look at uh, different case studies for how it's being applied in let's say education, in uh, therapy, uh -huh. in the law, in, um, there are lots of different areas. Um, oh, I'm just, just looking at those fields and imagining what, what some of those case studies might be. What's one yeah. of the most unusual or exciting or surprising case studies that you've, that you look at? Well, one thing that just seems to keep coming up a lot is therapy. Yeah is therapy that you know when people can really get that sense of the story and that they're part of it and not just some you know atomistic thing that is thrown off on the sideline mm -hmm. it changes everything it gives because meaning living it life with purpose meaning, right? is one of the foundations living for well-being life on purpose yeah. Yeah. living a life with purpose and on purpose i guess mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah. we have a, a whole bunch of therapists uh, who are now teaching, I mean, they've gone through the program, they're teaching in the program, they're applying it in their, you know, their work. Yeah. Um, so they're sharing. I, I honestly, I'd love to just get a whole sort of course specifically on therapy. Sure. Uh, because um, there, there's a lot of interest in that, but that's just one, you know, mm -hmm. there's the law, there's education. Um, and then what a business, you know, trying to figure oh, out a business, yeah. like what, what am I going to choose for a business? You could go through these principles and they're, it's just extremely helpful. What's the context? What's the matrix? What's the subjectivity, the subjectivity of all of the stakeholders? Yeah. How is this acting? Not just people? your shareholders, but you've exactly. got a planet, Good you've word. got an yeah. ecosystem, in words. you've got life from um, stakeholders and yeah. shareholders to stakeholders. Yeah. yeah, all of us are, if everything's interconnected, we're all stakeholders in yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Business everything is that. interrelated. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And then in the third module is the practicum. So people do projects. Ah, and, and apply, uh, make a project and then start applying it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, we have, we've, 
we've had a lot of religious um, go through the leadership program. Um, and some of the most active areas are in Asia where they've taken what they've learned and oh my gosh, they're applying it with thousands of people over in Asia. <laughs> they send us pictures and I'm just like blown away. Oh, <laughs> what's, what's an example over there? of one of the practicums? Yeah, what's one yeah. of the projects? In, um, uh, in Asia. Vietnam, China, Philippines, uh, where they are now incorporating this into the formation programs for the young sisters and priests who are who are, you know, um, who have joined, you know, come into a novitiate. How exciting. My yeah, God. I mean, the, the religious life is much different over in Asia than it is in, you know, the US and Europe. It's it's much more vital, much more alive. Oh, interesting. Um, well, congratulations yeah. to you, first of all, just amazing that you, you, yeah. you've planted a seed, you've planted a significant seed that it just is sprouting and growing ways that you couldn't have possibly imagined. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, tell us, because we find this interesting when, when somebody has a quest, right? What are the key questions I want answered in life? And then that, that sets a direction. It sets an arc for your journey. How would you describe that? What is your, I mean, you've followed doors open, things develop. This is, it's such a beautiful story that you're living, but what would you say would be your, your key question in life and how is that being answered? Mm. <laughs> your deep. Mm. I think uh, it certainly has to do with forming community inside yeah. of, you know, the science that we know now and drawing on the wisdom mm -hmm. and drawing on with ancient wisdom. I appreciate you know, where you're asking science to come together with a sense of the divine, the spiritual. Right. Yes. Which is sorely and then, lacking. And applying that in a way that's going to help our planet evolve to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, and this whole idea yeah. of a cold, dead machine, the universe is a whole dead machine that's running out of steam. You know, yeah. that... That idea is running out of steam. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, let's see it for what it is and who it is and ourselves. And yeah. 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 There's something when people who have this perspective, this immersion and this perspective, you know, for a while, when they get together, you can just spend hours. Mm. Honestly, this whole thing, your mind on deep time, deep time mind. Um, yeah. It's just different. It's different. You know, then audience questions now. Yeah. 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 So well, know, we can the chat room. There was something that um Tony said earlier in the chat. I think yeah. he had to leave. Um he just, He said he just he said interesting talk at last month's meeting at the American Astronomical Society. It's noted, quote, life is how the universe self-references. So see how unquote. far these ideas are percolating out there, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great. Exciting. It's kind that of is, Bobby well, says the embodiment piece is at the heart of practical mysticism. Mm -hmm. How, where do you define where for you does science end and mysticism begin? And I, is I, it just I, that, I, I just cannot draw that boundary. I can't. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thank you for not doing it. Yeah. Thank you. My boundary is our um, worldview hasn't expanded enough to include it in our society. But that doesn't mean that there's a division. And sometimes it just means that we have a okay. lack of perspective and then we need to open up some doors. And, yeah. and sometimes the word spirituality doesn't contain what we're saying. And then we say embodied spirituality to try to give it context that we're talking about something more profound that's embedded within everything. Well, and I think when you say embodied spirituality for me, that means, okay, the physical universe also from within is this temple. Yeah. It's it's sacred ground. Mm -hmm. All of this physical stuff. It's been denigrated uh over the over the ages. But no, this is this is the stuff of magic as well. Yeah. Right? Yes. Right here. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's one thing that science is really giving us is the mystery of matter. The mystery, matter mystery of matter. Not at all what we thought it was. <laughs> There, there's no there are no little hard balls at the bottom <laughs> no there is not 
<laughs> there is little pieces of stuff. <laughs> How would you it, describe that? Uh, well, what it is all the term you use for it. Consciousness it, it opens is kind of up. Open. You know, it the farther you go down, the more it just opens out. Mm. Uh, yeah, and the it, more you tear it apart, you realize there's no there there. Exactly. Yeah. We're always searching for the vocabulary to give to give to give uh, voice to these things, and it's such. Laura's just mentioned the word consciousness and how that gets abused and used a lot, and how that all you know, some all of us have our own interpretation of some of these words and how we use them, and it's uh, and like you said with embodied spirituality, you know. So we we're like right, walking that tightrope, trying to at least bring convey. From, what we're ex exploring here that's in words. direct experience is so valuable. And that's the, the other aspect words. to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all the but time. yeah. So that's, I'm sure it's a challenge for you and all of the work that you do, finding the mm -hmm. right terminology to, to express these thoughts. Also, it's a process, right? It's not like take a, take a pill, have the lightning bolt strike you once. It's a process of, mm. of your unfolding to it. It yeah. changes you bit by bit by bit. Mm, it's yeah. you're evolving with it. You yeah. have to put in some work. Yeah. So and that is so, so true. You cannot do this overnight. Right. Yeah. I'm going to invite uh, Brian back into the discussion. Uh, obviously, is uh, mm -hmm. the uh, person that's going to have <laughs> the greatest impact in oh. being able to connect the worlds together. But, Brian, you know. Yes. You well, Jennifer, I wondered if we could break open this concept as kind of a emerging concept of belonging what we're discovering in the network about the importance of people coming to this work and, and recognizing this intimate intimate sense of belonging. And how, how can this work help foster that? I wonder if you could say something to that point. Yeah, I, I love that you brought up that word, uh, Brian, because as you know, we're in very deep conversations with Mary Coelho about that very word. And, um, yeah, well, when you really allow yourself to sink into deep time mind, um, you can't help but come away with that very profound idea that I actually belong. Mm -hmm. um, I matter. What I do matters. Yeah. Um, and through our veins runs the cosmic yeah stuff yeah yeah exactly so um what one of the teachers who's been very active with um cosmic education with our network i worked with him a lot kyle herman um he does a lot with um secondary students and of course you know in high school or adolescence i would say this whole question is, am I, in the need to be validated, you know, is so intense, so uh -huh. intense. And so when they first, you know, get to know the story and they see the bigness of it, their first reaction is, I'm so small. I'm so small in this, you know, big, big thing. But then the more they work with it, they come to this really deep sense of belonging and understanding that what they do matters and what um, mary likes to talk about is confidence you know belonging belonging and confidence go together right because if you have a sense of belonging that and you know you matter that makes you feel confident so when you feel confident then you can do a lot of stuff so the belonging sense we matter leading to confidence um, is, I mean, that's one of the main purposes of all this work. It really is. I think human flourishing just comes with this turf, right? It's just part of the territory. Mm -hmm. You immerse yourself into this and you're flourishing just as the universe wants you. It's delivering through all those receptor sites, the juice, right? The life force, mm. the joy, the creativity, the the sense of comfort. Yeah. 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 But you need to do it in community too. You know, yeah. community is really important. 
Um, like you, you can do it on your own to some extent. You could read a story, read a book, um, go out, be in nature. All of those are fantastic ways. Um, but being in community takes you to another level. And then sustaining that, you know, sustaining that over time. I mean, this is what our church is. This is what religion is about. You know, I mean, this is what it's always been about. Mm -hmm. um, and we're finding like new forms for this now. Yeah. I like the sense that my community has grown to be, to understand, hey, my backyard is the cosmos. Right. I'm in this giant community, not only with my fellow humans, but the ecosystem and mm -hmm. and the cosmos. Right. Oh, that's so well said, Laura. Thank you for saying that. That's so important. Your perspective expands. Yeah. And and yeah. this flip side of technology nowadays, we come bringing it back to like we're doing right now, where we can have discussions with people that are in Australia, people that are in Europe, people that are U.S., Canada, wherever. We can have a discussion on the, on a Sunday morning for a couple hours, um, which we couldn't have before in the past. And so that in this way, at least. Uh, so that's so another power. Is it an accident from your perspective that this noosphere, we haven't even used that term yet, um, has developed the hardware for us to be all connected? It's no accident. It's happening at this time. Ah, that's an interesting. Right? Exactly. It's just saying, hey, you all need some new conduits here. Yeah. Right. You need some yeah. new yeah. connectivity. Let's yeah. I mean, so I guess yeah. the science had to grow to develop the tech and look at all the minerals and everything that we use. It's like right here on Earth. Like, yeah. So it provides, yeah. provides the bridges. <laughs> hey, we want you to go and cross the abyss. Well, now we're going to provide you a bridge. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how I see it. Good the positive spin you. on technology. This was something that I learned in my childhood from a very wise adult. The universe does not ask you to do something that you're actually not able to do. So when you see a challenge, find, dig up the, the wherewithal to do it, mm. right? Yeah. That gave me great uh, confidence early yes. on. And I think that, it's true. The universe is providing the means by which it's, we, we can do what we're being Beautiful. guided to do. Mm. Yeah. So thank, yeah. thank you for all the tech. <laughs> just yeah. use it well right yeah right so and, and brian you follow up and give you a chance i just want to add one more thing because for me deep time leadership has meant being able to live in the gap between what the world is today and what our hearts know is possible and that takes a kind of prophetic mm -hmm. imagination and i think um you know in the in the training the deep time leadership training it, it brings a form of adaptive leadership, a servant leadership mentality. Um, how, do, how do we create from the chaos in which we are currently living without denying that chaos, aff affirming that there is something wiser and truer that's wanting to be midwifed, wanting to come through and be born? So that I just wondered, that that's one other aspect that I see, Jennifer, about our about the deep time program, the adaptive, the adaptive aspect. Then Absolutely. I want to ask you, Jennifer, um, and Brian is part of your board, you said, how do you decide and make decisions as to where to take deep time or what's the next project or are you listening into what's emerging? Tell us a little bit about both of you, yeah. your process. How do you, what are your tips on I, doing that? Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, what you're, what you're saying is so true. And we, we just had this emergent dialogue um, uh, session was that last week or the week before yeah I think that was no the week before inside the leadership program and that's really all about sort of growing the antenna mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know developing these uh, um, a more sensitive uh, capacity for sensing for sensing what's needed you know what what is trying to be called forth yeah. and um so we're in committee meetings now about exactly this. And one of the words that's been coming up is um, leading. And I, I did put that in the um, subjectivity slide. Leading is a Quaker word, actually, which is where oh, okay. the community, you know, talks and then they get a sense of a leading, uh, being led, you know, and in, inside of our context, being led by the universe. What is the universe trying to do here? Mm -hmm. What is the universe imagining? And then, like just in the last meeting where we're envisioning all of this, I asked everybody 
what's the universe doing inside of each one of you right now? And what kind of answers were you getting? Oh, it was, it was just, uh, it was really interesting. It was, um, the theme that just came out so strong was, I'm so glad we're taking the time to really be with these questions and not try to act too quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. That was the most, that theme came out in every single person. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. from the head, but from some other yeah. part of yeah. it. It's tuned in mm -hmm. to that yeah. urgent yeah. call yeah. from the universe. Mm -hmm. Pick up the phone, right? Yeah. Create the dial. And that, that, gave, that gave me confidence, just hearing that from them, because I was worried that, oh my gosh, are, am, I, am I taking people's too much, too much time or whatever? No, not at all. Yeah. It's just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, not at all. There's a tendency to rush, and but you're miss out, missing out on the the full gratitude. Uh, gr you know what gratitude. we're finding also is that people appreciate a safe space mm. in which to talk from that depth of being mm. and yeah. those musings, and yeah. where we each can um, share that language, share that, yeah. share yeah. that opening. Exactly. So yeah, we yeah. Don't get enough of that. We don't create enough of that in space. Yeah, society. <laughs> yeah. and that's then we also and we entered into an emergent dialogue space mm -hmm. so that's that's also really really helpful do you have a rule set for setting up an emergent dialogue space what is how do you set the parameters for that um uh well most of us have experienced it with um marion rowe who's the trainer in the leadership program who is an emergent dialogue do you know her mm -mm. Uh, yeah um, she's wonderful, by the way. She she'd be a good person for your. I was just uh, writing her name down. Yeah. I'm going to follow up with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, emergent dialogue. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's really shifting gears, mm -hmm. uh, like slowing way way down, and then just allowing a lot of space, mm. and uh, people can say a word or a phrase for what's coming to them, what's arising. So it's not about trying to, uh, you know, accomplish an agenda. Right. It's more about just what's what's arising now. Mm -hmm. This does remind me, and it's a story I've told before in previous conversations, but we have a good friend who's a consultant to native tribes up in the Northwest of the United States. And he says he goes to the meetings and he, at one time we had him on our board of directors and Laura and I talk a thousand miles an hour and the conversations going around the table. And he finally said, you know, I want to just share with you something I witnessed when I go to the, and, and, and I'm able to sit in on the meetings with the, the elders of particular tribes. Guy will speak slowly. He takes his time. He holds the talking stick. And when he's done, he sits it on the table and he lets go. And it's silence. People don't rush to grab the stick. Yeah. And then finally someone picks it up and said, you know, I was listening to what Barry was saying, and I think this, and I'm thinking that maybe the we should go this direction. And then lay the stick down, pause. All kinds of time <laughs> goes by for people to yeah. digest what's being discussed. Unlike most of us in the Western world that is like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Don't allow a second of space to be between <laughs> sentences. It was, it was just like, okay, so let's conduct our board meeting and slow down. If we slow it down to half pace, we're still 10,000 times faster than the native people. Well, but at the least the difference was we went around because yeah. we didn't want the people who were more silent not right. to speak right. fully. Right. Right. We wanted to hear, and boy, did they have some profound things yeah. to say. Yeah, sorry. Everybody so gets a turn. Go around no one's in a around. hurry and no one has to respond. Listen. And then we conduct our own yeah. husband wife meeting. And we did that. Yeah, husband and wife, because otherwise neither one of us will get a word in edgewise. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, well, Brian, uh, I, again, thank you so much for being such a change maker. Yes. I, I know, you, I know, you brought that term to us from the Ashoka Foundation. That term, change makers, and you're definitely a change maker. You're always contributing to all these different organizations in different and powerful ways. Keep Brian up I mean, on screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. And let's go talk to Dwayne next. Okay, Dwayne. Yep, you have Dwayne coming oh, up. Okay, thank you. After that. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. We'll, hey, we'll, Dwayne. We'll get the yeah. Oh. Uh, this has been very interesting. And to me, I'm a crystal and a, a fossil dealer. And so every Saturday I go to a farmer's market and I lay out ammonites and other types of crystals. And this is a physical object that you can hold in your hand that's 
hundreds of millions of years old. Yeah. And so there's this physical connection to a time when all the continents were all connected together and it helps to understand the dynamic being that the earth really is, that it's moving and shifting over a scale of time that's almost beyond our imagination ability to connect to. And so when I explain this to people, and particularly the little kids that come to my booth, <laughs> and it just kind of blows their mind. So they have something that they can take home with them and hold in their hand that begins to connect them to this idea of deep time. And how you got to love a little creature that is in total imitation of our spiral galaxy. In right. Its form. Yeah. yeah, the fractal <laughs> geometry of it, and the yeah. Fibonacci series, there's just so much about that. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you take the opportunity to offer these beautiful life forms with that perspective and that education. You're lighting up those kids' brains. Absolutely, yeah. And hearts, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's so Can you speak a little bit about the mammalian um, evolution and what are the deep insights that you found, Jennifer? One of your children's books is about that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, I, the, the, the one that just jumped right out when you asked the question is how a tiny, tiny change makes a huge difference over time. Like Bucky's <laughs> trim tab principles. Yeah. So um, let's see, a shift in the pelvis, very tiny shift in the pelvis enabled humans to stand up. Mm -hmm. And then that had the consequence of freeing the hands. Oh, right. Now we can carry things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then think of all the things that that led to, you know, with, um, mm -hmm. you know, tool, making tools, um, with crafting things and building spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> Creating the internet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Creating the internet. It all started with a little change in the pelvis. But yeah. but the, to me, that's, um, you know, it's like, what is the little change that I, I need to make in my life? You know, that could make a big difference. But I don't, I'm not even able to see all the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like Guided really time. being attentive, being attentive to everything. Like little changes count. <laughs> yeah. And those little changes that are those promptings, right? Yeah. You don't even know the consequences and doors that it's going to open down the road. You just exactly. Try. Yeah. Exactly. You, you you go to the coffee shop one day and while you're there, you meet this person who becomes <laughs> critical to the whole future of your life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention to that inner GPS is signaling you like <laughs> exactly. You have all these receptor sites. Pay attention. Yeah, yeah indeed. Yeah. Good yeah. good points, Dwayne. Did you have more? Uh, no, no, that's all. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Yeah, that's a great, that beautiful. It's a great uh, yeah. uh, addition. Let's go to Fred Smith over here. Fred, uh, Professor Emeritus of Sanskrit. He's a Vedic scholar. Uh, from the University of Iowa, originally here, and uh, he's always had some great insights. I mean, we talk about having a culture that has a perspective on time. Ancient India, they have that perspective of time like no others on the planet. I mean, they've always seemed to have some kind of relationship to that uh, as well. So deep time lives within the Vedic traditions. Yeah, it's it's really very, very complicated, and there's always new timely observations about it. <laughs> and uh, but my question to you is I'm I'm kind of trying to envision how it is that you actually do your work I suppose you and and Brian whom I've discovered just last week I have much more in common with than I knew and uh, um, that uh, do you go into schools and teach groups of children do you have like online seminars or I mean you have a few books but how, how do you actually how do you actually do what you, you know, do all of this? That's good questions. I'm all well, ears. Um, it <clears throat> depends on the audience, obviously. So if it's for um, children, that would be one thing. And then for the teachers, I mostly now I work with the teachers and then the teachers take the materials into the classroom. But if I were with um, 
students here i'll show you a picture uh like elementary school teachers or what actually uh, now it's uh it's uh, i do work with uh, teachers of all levels all levels oh. yeah so for example down at the houston montessori center which is the largest teacher training uh, for montessori um, teachers in the country they have um uh, Montessori teachers in training for all levels from infant toddler all the way through through secondary. So um, they want because it's Montessori and they have a big vision, they want all their teachers to be situating what they're doing inside the cosmic story. Mm -hmm. So sense. they're seeing themselves, they're seeing their work as what Maria Montessori said. Um, evolving the universe yeah so um they're all in there i give them a, an immersion in the story the science of the story i give them an immersion in experiencing the story i do some storytelling for them and then of course we have a lot of conversations um and then uh they're broken into breakout groups according to their level first their level and then they talk about with their own level um, how they see their level inside the story. What is the unique place of being an elementary teacher inside the story? Yeah. And then, uh, for example, or a secondary or infant toddler, whatever it is, because also part of the training has to do with the developmental phases. And then, and then they're put into breakout groups across levels. So you'll have an infant oh, toddler teacher with a high school teacher mm -hmm. and then everything in between. And so then they're all talking there, well, this is what we're doing down at, you know, infant toddler. And then th this, this is what's happening up at secondary. Now they connect it all. You see what I mean? Yeah, they connect the it. Flow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really exciting for them because they see their place. They see their place in the great continuum. Yeah. Um, and it's they can place in order some good visual aids to Dwayne. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, storytelling is a big is a big part of this, Fred. Uh -huh. um, you know, storytelling that's very captivating. As uh, Mario Montessori always said, um, story comes first, then study. So first you've got to light the heart on fire. And then once the heart's on fire, you can do anything, you know, because now it's coming from the inside of the student. It's coming from, ins they're not being told, you got to learn this, you got to learn that, you got to do that. No, it's not like that at all, not at all. Mm -hmm. they're on fire like a ball of fire Maria Montessori talked about talk, it's like a ball of fire coming in and then you just put the materials out there and they just go after it mm -hmm. on their own because they're internally motivated mm -hmm. um, their natural curiosity their natural eagerness to learn because it gives uh, them something that is lighting yeah. them up and it was Muriel Ruckhauser who said yeah. the world is not made up of atoms, but of stories. So just right. remember that. Mm -hmm. um, as a professor, Fred, how did you employ some of these principles and story? It must've come up in your classroom oh. as well. Oh yeah. I mean, somebody who deals with, with India or classical India, like I did, you know, it's like, there's always stories yeah. and you always sort of draw people in through stories. There's short stories. There's, middling stories, there's long stories, there's stories as long as goes all the way back to the Big Bang and okay. further. And uh, I'm I'm a, a good storyteller, but I've been around great storytellers and I know the difference. There's, you know, once you can bring a person into the fact that a life can be modeled through, after and within, certain narratives then then you can open open up you know it's it's like looking at both ends of a 
of a it's like sitting at the middle of an hourglass you know right uh, you have like the the whole world of subjectivity above and the or below or whatever and the and objectivity above so you have like different kinds of substantialities that go into the uh you know towards the refinement towards the source of creation as it were and then you have all these individual monads kind of and you're kind of the link connecting all of it up and it just you know if you can do that successfully with any subject then you can expand their vision and put them into that but maybe that's what you're doing i think by making all of these connections you know there was a, a mutual friend of both mine and brian's who died a couple of weeks ago and uh, he was he was a master at that of sitting at the at the center of the hourglass mm-hmm. and, and drawing people from way at the top and the material up from the bottom who and um, his name was rick jarrow but he died a couple of weeks ago anyway it's another story but uh uh but that's what i kind of see that you're trying to do with your bring about this interconnectedness uh, it's, it's really nice what i'm hearing yeah yeah you yeah. say that a life can be modeled through certain narratives that just underscores for me the whole importance of the world needs a new story because it does shape us so much it is that yeah. through thread that we can all um in, employ and build community over right and we need that new story right so it's powerful and, and, and in fred's case fred you know spending a lifetime of research going deep into the uh deep into the the philosophy and the understanding and, and, and all the literature of of that part of the world and then coming back out of that and, and then saying, okay people this is what i learned here's a story i can tell you that you, hopefully you'll be i'll be able to share with you because i mean that you know, you <clears throat> Are you asking what that story is for him? Well, uh, well, that's part of the question, but yeah, mm-hmm. I guess it's being able to, and then lo, lo, I love what Jennifer's done is she's, she's taking it down to the grade school level. How well, can and we up to this? the adults, right? Up from the Eight adult, times yeah, about both directions. I that's understand. all. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fascinating because the, because the story of ancient uh, India is very complex. So for most of us who don't have a lifetime to spend to understand that they didn't grow up in that culture, we 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 assign people like Fred, go figure this out and come back and tell us about it. What did you find? Or Jennifer, <laughs> distill all the science down for yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let's do a conversation for exploration in the future with Fred on that. Yeah, exactly. All right. You good. You Great idea. My 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 grandmother had a she had a term, she called it essentialize. Mm. essentialized exactly that you know, you start with the brainstorming just mm-hmm. really just throwing it all out there right this yeah. just huge effusive <laughs> effusiveness and then yeah. like what is what's the essence here what's the yeah. essence and we yeah. distill this down to figure out what's what's really at the core what's at the core yeah yeah, yeah. wow Dig. Right, i was just going to mention one thing um an aspect of rick jero and you mentioned the uh, sitting at the intersection of this yeah. kind of uh, hourglass. shape, uh, yeah, of the hourglass. It's a little bit. I remember Rick talking about sitting at the crossroads, uh-huh. and how often in across different mythologies are characters that have been faced with crossroads, and and the value of that place of being in that middle place, drawing from above and below. And uh, being in the presence in order to discern what needs to emerge. That's very much what I experienced within the context of deep time and um, oh. emergent dialogue and what Jennifer, what you're, what what we bring into the program. I also experienced that with the Cuyamanga Institute. Wow, um, that's so great to that, hear. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there's great parallels. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. Well, I can really see that. I absolutely yeah. see that. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. Wow. 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 You know, it's it's interesting. You mentioned Ignatian pedagogy, and I'm not familiar with the Jesuits and all of that, but where, I mean, I understood all your other references of what influenced you or what your principles are built on, but what is the essential principles there? How do you explain the Jesuits and what they're about for this? Okay, so the um, to see God in everything is... That's the core Jesuit idea. You know, it's not just seeing God in church, not just seeing God in a certain place, not in a certain thing, Mm -hmm. but seeing God everywhere. 
So then um, it centers on what's your experience of that? How are you experiencing that? And then how do you take that experiencing in? And then how do you discern with that? Mm -hmm. and put it into action. I mean, I'm making this very simple right now. But, Thank you. That's what we have. I mean, you know, um, I mean, I went through a whole um, spiritual direct three year spiritual direction training, Ignatian spiritual direction training. Oh wow! Hmm. Where it's, I mean, this is the core idea. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Dawn is saying in the chat room, this is incredible synchronicity. I knew I had to be here today. Yeah, yeah. Um, she has her hand up as well. Yeah, yeah. let's go to Dawn next. Okay, thank you, Fred. Always a pleasure. There <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go to Dawn. Hello, Dawn. Hello, this is delightful. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the presentation and what, what you've been sharing, Jennifer and and Paula and Laura. Um, aside from the shocking and news about Rick Jaro. Um, uh -huh. So uh, my question was for you, Jennifer, do you use um, Mary, Mary Evelyn Tucker, the universe story? Um, I met her in person years ago where she presented that movie. I wondered if, you know, and Thomas Berry was integral to that. I was just wondering if you that include that in your curriculum. Absolutely. That is required viewing, required reading for I'm not surprised. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do the program without that. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mary, Mary Evelyn is a really dear friend of mine uh, as well. You know, she lives in Connecticut. And so I, I get to see her, you know. I'm not far from Princeton. I, we go there you know, I'm in Westchester, Pennsylvania. We go oh. there often. And um, I would love to meet with you sometime. I've sure. okay. written a book called Morning Wind, um, Birthing a New Way. And uh -huh. I've, um, for years, when I was chairman of the Alliance for a Sustainable Future, I said, what we're doing is creating a culture of belonging, oh. renewal, and joy. Oh. Oh, yeah. 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 So oh, thank that's you. So oh, great. That's great. Oh my gosh, Dawn, that's wonderful. You know, can we talk about the fact that so many of these voices, um, Maria and uh, Teilhard and Thomas Berry, they were talking in a culture that tried to shut them down and they carried on, right? They weren't there with their organization supporting what they were doing. They were a voice and they kept going. How do you um, can you speak to that? Because sometimes you just have to defy the world around you and go with what you know to be true. Go with where you're being led. Have the courage to listen and carry forth and get it down. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. I mean, all these key people had to have a lot of, you know, but they were being led. Absolutely. Um I want to do you know they're following they're following the leader and I think that gives people courage yeah and, you know when I think each one of these people um had to put up with huge adversity but they, 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 did, they did so because they had to I mean I had to also I mean I in my own life I I, I had nice. a lot of adversity <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you're driven but, yeah. 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 Exactly. It's like not a question. Don, let, let's stay in touch because there's some conversations that we could be having. Oh, the Alliance for a Sustainable Future. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah for sure. And um, birthing a new way. What are you saying in your book, Don? That relates most yeah. to theory. Like one or two I, sentences. I, yeah. yeah. Well, I give eleven pathways for uplifting humanity, and um, within each of the 11 pathways, I have an activity for someone to do. So I just created, I just completed a six month program, which was an addition, you know, a supplement, which was a series of Zoom calls on a monthly basis, um, a series of Zoom calls to supplement what's in the book. It's a short little handbook, but it's a guidebook mm -hmm. for, a, you know, we're all 
moving towards uplifting humanity. Yeah. So. Wouldn't, uh, here's what I was going to say, wouldn't all those um, voices from the past that we've been talking about, did they, they had an inkling, I'm sure, that their words would be received. Even Buckminster Fuller said that. I am creating solutions for tomorrow. They'll be needed. I'm creating them and inventing them today because I know, I can sense what the future will will need. And yeah. I think that they were all on that same tack. And the trim tab principle, hey, there's a big ship heading this way. If you just make a tiny change, it's going to um, have a huge difference in its course as time okay. grows, right? Okay. And so, um, you know, it, it's interesting how many voices today, Brian, uh, this Brian Tucker has, and we have many meetings on, look at all the organizations, look at all the voices wow. that are now, hey, I've got a contribution to make, and I am hearing the call. I am downloading collective from the universe this vision this mission this juice this creativity this drive the strength the emotional resilience to get out there and and do it yeah. it's exciting and you talk about community jennifer it's exciting just to see i may not know all these people but it's exciting to see it bubbling up and to know that there's a greater community there and that um you know pax romana that was all about all the sheaves when each bendable, but when you put them together, they're stronger. So mm. I appreciate uh, your work and hey, let's bring all these groups together. Let's have a, a would, node point to yeah. discuss. <laughs> in the Western world, we're, yeah. having to, we're having to re-educate ourselves on the concept uh, of community in some ways. We've kind of yeah. isolated ourselves into groups and organizations, mm -hmm. religions against each other, you know, forward thinking groups, but who don't want to recognize the other group that's doing the oh, same thing. You're citing Paul Ray, who we talked to like 20 years ago. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, the cultural creatives. And he said that the problem with the cultural creatives is you all are leading your own little organizations, but you're not turning around and Everybody. knowing that you could all be a part of a coalition right? and, uh, and work together. We're all and directors of a nonprofit. <laughs> right, we go, we're in Sedona, okay? we go to dinner parties yeah. And you meet a bunch of new people. And we've gone to dinner parties where um, the, the local vegan community holds 70 people can show up, right? Yeah. And you're sitting around with all these new people. And what do you do? Oh, we lead a nonprofit. What do you do? Oh, we lead yeah. What do you do? Oh, it's a nonprofit. <laughs> what do you do? You know, I teach. You know, you know, it's yeah. hilarious, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Tick, tick, change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now we've got the app, Blink app, where we just like take our phones up to connect and pick, mm -hmm. like, cause there's yeah. so many that you have to meet. Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, that uh, is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, so Brian has a chart with all these organizations and they're all wonderful. I'm like, yeah. yeah it, Go ahead, Brian. Don will be eager to learn about what efforts you're doing as well in your book and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. alongside the global collective consciousness work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Don, for jo joining us today, for sure. Thanks for finding us. Be in touch. Yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> so. Perfect. Well, well, Jennifer, I, I wanted to mention one thing about the um, in the Mammals uh, Who Morph book, there's a part where you talk about in every crisis before, a surprising breakthrough happened. And that's what I find so inspiring about the deep time work is it gives us a vision mm -hmm. by looking at the example of what the universe has done and the creativity that has been unleashed. Crisis has a way of unleashing a creativity and a human potential. So, you know, I just wanted to mention that. That's yeah. an aspect I really appreciate. And that's I hear so that great. day coming. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's, that's so. Thank you so much for bringing that up, um, Brian, because that's such a big theme in in the leadership program. People are dealing with crises, huge crises in their lives. You know, whether it's a health crisis or a family crisis or a job crisis. <clears throat> and so, you know, being able to look to cosmic stories and to see that breakdown and is, is normal, actually. I mean, it's completely normal. <laughs> yeah. and, and to see, to really look at what is the new thing that's coming out of it? What's the new thing? What's the new energy? What are the new relationships? Because the new is always made out of the out of the old, but in a different configuration. So mm -hmm. how is the configuration changing such that it's opening up the possibility for an entirely new pathway if you decide to take it? Mm -hmm. So you know, Earth it's is reassuring. It's it's 
Yeah. It's back to confidence. It gives us confidence, belonging. We matter. Confidence. Yeah. For me, it's like punctuated equilibrium, right? The universe has delivered the blows to Mother Earth where it's like, hey, let's wipe the slate clean and create new conditions. New life has to evolve in order to carry on and life will find a way. And so I find that um, I, I use that principle in my own life. Okay, um, wipe the slate, slate clean and now you need to rethink your whole existence. Mm -hmm. We've all gone through those, haven't we? Crisis oh, yeah. or are they wonderful <laughs> opportunities? Mm -hmm. Right, or, or the hero journey. Hey, the road is gonna grow rocky sometime and look at it like the challenge. Hey, new uh, new attributes right. need to be developed right now <laughs> to get across the abyss. That's the way I see it. So I appreciate what you're saying and they seem to be scheduled. And I appreciate that it's just going to happen. So roll with it, right? Pivot. Mm -hmm. Be good at pivot. What pivot in the pirouette is part of your dance this is uh, a, sequence? This is, need it. Sorry. this is an interesting discussion because we're talking about an alternate universe almost from what you read in the news every day. But in the news, we're seeing so much divisiveness and so much separation among people's thoughts and uh, religions and then also um, politics mainly. Um, and so it's just like we're all at this Press, where we need to find something where there's an interconnectedness that it gets okay to be a friend with someone who's also a conservative and it's okay for a conservative to be friends with someone who's a liberal it's and okay it's, just not to talk politics and it's all, always okay not to talk politics uh, exactly but yeah. in a, when you put it to the grander scale of what jennifer is talking about today i think you know it's such a healthy reminder for us to come back to to center about what it is to be human and what it is to be a part of this piece of this puzzle uh, as a humanity and how as Brian puts it, we can all be change makers and we can all participate in that change, that we all can be a part of something greater than ourselves. Well, not only that, but if you want to go, and I think that part of what your work, Jennifer, is how has the universe survived so beautifully? How has it evolved? Mm. It's got these principles down. We learn from those principles. And so look to who's got the longest track record of success, right? Mm -hmm. That's good business. I would say the cosmos uh, in her evolution, that's a good track record to follow. What are the principles? So can you name, um, you you gave us some basic principles from yeah. context to matrix to continuum to subjectivity and action. But what do you think that for a personal life strategy, yeah. what have you learned from your study of deep time that we can apply yeah. to when the the strategies mm. we're looking for what it's a yeah. good when this interview ends how, yeah. what, what have we what, what have we learned to <laughs> <laughs> and tell us some stories of how it worked for you if you would oh my gosh um so many um but for starters you have to be flexible mm. you, flexible you can't be rigid yeah. you can't be rigid you've got to be flexible and you've got to be moving with the matrix you know, really, really understanding what your matrix is mm -hmm. and where, where, where the aliveness is in that matrix so yeah. that you can keep shifting and then aligning with that and where it's not alive in the matrix, go away from that, <laughs> go toward where the life is. And that's the leading, that's the leading. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, listen listen for the leading and 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 grow the sensitivity to be able to listen and it's it's a very different kind of energy it's wow. it's different from what we've been taught um it's a I, listening energy i had a very good friend gwen spencer no longer with us but she would teach people to write the story of your own life like a hero mm -hmm. in the hero journey mm -hmm. and if you don't like the way it's going rewrite it Rewrite your. If you don't like your past, rewrite it. Put it in a new context. But the mm. point being that we are, we can be our own agents of change for our own life. We can direct it. Beautiful. We can tell ourselves a new story individually, as we're all trying to do collectively. And I thought yeah. that was so 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 empowering, right? Yeah. So empowering. And if we can if we can handle it for our own individual selves, I think it gives us some good practice some good skill sets to contribute to the collective story as well. Mm. Well, I think the idea that we actually are the universe. Are the universe. 
We are the universe. It's not we're in the universe. We, we are. are the universe. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that changes everything because it's not just you're not being dictated to from something outside. You're actually part of it. You are it. We are it. It's happening because of us. You know, and everything else that exists right now. We're all co-creators, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our job, our cosmic task. Yeah, our cosmic gifts and our cosmic task. And then the cosmic gift gives us our cosmic task. Yeah. yeah. It gives us the wherewithal to go at this task. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you imagine the universe and all that it is. You've got great resources to draw upon. Mm. Do you not? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you got a community out there right we're all dancing together so well this this is why this this is such a, a uh ultimately the broadest of topics that we cover as part of our conversations and every week i'm challenged with the same dilemma and that is is that when i do the write-up for people to come i'm asking the question why do I want to spend two hours on a Sunday to go to this discussion? <laughs> you know, because what is it that they're saying? And, and you know, coming from the old days of, of having some experience in the world of sales, there was the term features and then there's benefits. So what is the benefits of having a discussion about deep time and how can I impact my life from that? So those are the questions I was asking myself last night as I was getting ready to send out the invitation today. And uh, so I, I think you've done a really fabulous job of giving us the benefits that idea of being flexible moving with the matrix finding the align the aliveness shifting and aligning listening to the leading we are the universe i mean all those you're giving us a new language you're giving yes. us a new language and I, yeah. this was this is one of the most important ones for you to attend on a sunday everybody so you did a good job by coming <laughs> <laughs> i'm keeping you up for her leadership program yeah yeah exactly yeah. very yeah. cool well, what a blessing to have you here. And of course, we always keep complimenting Brian. He's going to get a big head pretty soon, but uh, he doesn't he doesn't <laughs> seem to seem to take it all in strong. But uh, thank you both so much for being here and for your continued participation, not only in global collective consciousness uh, understandings, but also in your, your work. Part of just our cosmic education. Cosmic right? education program. Yeah. yeah, exactly. What do you want to say uh, by summing up? Any parting words other than, and let us... Again, I'll join in Paul's thank you. Well, Everything that, he said, I agree with. Yeah, and let, let Brian do his final thoughts, okay. and then we'll, we'll let Jennifer Perfect. do final thoughts. He's very good at finales. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm. I, I just want to highlight, again, one more part from Mammals Who Morph, if I may, Jennifer. It, it's, it's, and I think it's a change-making statement. Um, you may not know where you're headed, but you're part of something much bigger than humans, and that's why you two have exactly the powers you need, the powers of imagination, love and decision making I, I find that to be so affirming of the stage that we're at collectively so thank you ah, thank you brian that's so great <laughs> I, I can't add to that that's that really says it that says it yeah uh, <clears throat> we have what we need we all have what we need our planet has what it needs mm. we just have to be aware and follow the leading and work together. So you see a lot of hope for our future, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. Absolutely. Because, um, I mean, that's, of course, another theme. This is a brinksmanship universe. It is totally a brinksmanship universe. And, you know, from the very first fraction of a second, when you had a billion particles and antiparticles destroying each other, and a few made it through, just a few made it through. but. Um, we can, it's, you know, we can make it and it's, but it, it's going to take something. It will take something for sure. It's going to take it's something. It's a miracle that the universe exists at all, right? That exactly. All these conditions <clears throat> together. We cannot yeah. blow it <clears throat> given all that. <laughs> life will continue just that we may not be a part of it if we don't figure it out yeah yeah and i i think this we're is gonna figure it out i feel very confident about that yeah Beautiful. i also yeah. want to say that to all our friends that have um are on a news fast that have uh are on the verge of giving up hope for the world are exhausted 
I'm going to say, oh, well, this is medicine. This is the medicine you need right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. That's so great, Laura. That's yeah. wonderful. Oh, you're going to download some universal well, joy, mm -hmm. life force. You I know, love that. Sorry. This is the medicine. And coming back yeah. to what you shared an hour ago, Jennifer, and that was the application mm -hmm. in the field of psychology is something that's totally, it's kind of taking you by surprise, but how significant that that can be by simply having a hope yeah. for the future, having an opportunity to see yourself as the universe. We are the universe, that concept. I and then all of a sudden, uh, now I have, uh, now yeah. I know where I fit in. I may not fit in with my family, but I do fit in with the, I fit in with the greater family for sure. Oh. I mean, <laughs> I that you started with kids and now like adults need this too. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So I want okay. to say- Final um, thoughts. Okay, Brian, um, Jennifer, did this answer your question? Uh, that Brian started out with, that perhaps what we do could be a practice that would oh, help hmm. um, fit into this whole yeah. scheme of things. What do you want to say? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't have that much experience with it, but it, it seems like, I mean, it seems like a fit. The, you know, the bodily positions and so on and yeah. stances. Uh, because embodiment, I mean, just from my own experience with storytelling, it's powerful. Yeah. It's really powerful. Yeah. Well, there's so and, much. And I want to see you in that story, Kate, one of these days. Yeah, yeah. Story, yeah. Kate. Oh, yeah. Well, here, I'll show you right now. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's right a, here. A story, Kate convention. Oh, oh there we are. Oh, well. Now go go yeah. full screen and see. Oh, there it is. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, and it lights up. It looks oh, like, yeah. Tony will oh, be yeah. so jealous. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Tony's our astrophysicist. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, you two. What a Thank wonderful you discussion. You both have always continued to add such a an, an interesting aspect to the work that we do just yeah. by having the relationship with you. So let's continue We're the discussion. Partake of your curriculum yeah. here. Yeah. 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 And great them as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, for making this happen. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. Yeah. It's wonderful to have you. Thank, thank you, Paul and Laura. And thank congratulations you on all you've done. Yeah.